Hello and welcome to News Click. Today is a very special day. We have with us Arundhati Roy, the author of two luminous novels, The God of Small Things and The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Last year, she published her collection of nonfiction with a very great title, My Seditious Heart, a title that I think is not only very clever, but very apposite. Um, recently, during the midst of the COVID-19 great lockdown, she's written two pieces in the Financial Times. First, the pandemic is a portal, and now, after the lockdown, we need a reckoning. Arundhati Roy, welcome to News Click. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, pleasure. let's uh, start with the first article, the pandemic is a portal, which the Financial Times ran, and I mean, I know this article circulated enormously. Um, could you tell us a little bit Firstly, it's written in your phenomenal style. It's really lovely. But could you tell us just a little bit about this idea of the pandemic as a portal? I, I think, you know, when, when I was writing it, uh, I had just come back from actually um, walking to the border of UP and speaking to uh, the people who were, you know, the great reverse migration, the great exodus from... India cities and I realized that something was tectonically shifting you know the power of the entire world now over people I don't think there's been a time in history where the whole world could be locked down for good or for bad it's it was a very frightening idea for me that people governments states authoritarian democratic communist whoever could could exercise such power. And then when you exercise that power, the, 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 the chemical experiment of people who were outside the purview, outside the imagination, outside the calculations of these states were these millions of people who started to walk, you know? And, and, and then as the lockdown even, uh, you know, went on for a few days, you saw uh, in a city like Delhi, the client, the sky's clear, the peacocks come, the birds sing, the you know, smoke disappear. And I thought, you know, is this, are we dying or are we being born? You know, because as individuals, we don't have a choice about when we are being born and when we are dying. But perhaps as a species, we do, you know, some control we could exercise on this. And so I... I thought we are in a portal between worlds, you know. Uh, I, I used to, to, to think of this world as a graveyard full of people who are alive, but, you know, the light has faded, the, 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 the stars have died, and we're just pretending to be alive, and we know we've destroyed this planet. But then suddenly when you saw the potential of healing that the, the show that the Earth put on, you know, we thought, okay, Maybe there is a moment of hope in the midst of this despair, or maybe it's just greater despair. But certainly, it's a moment of rupture, a moment of choosing. So that's why I thought of it as a portal. There's a very powerful section here where you talk about the Prime Minister. And you say in that his methods, because after all, he announced the lockdown and said, you have four hours to you know, sheltered in place, essentially. And you write, the Prime Minister's methods definitely give the impression that he thinks of citizens as a hostile force that needs to be ambushed, taken by surprise, but never trusted. When I read this, I thought also of the way demonetization was rolled out. It's demonetization, it's the great lockdown, it's the Prime Minister who thinks of citizens as a hostile force. Can you reflect some more on this? Well, I, I too was thinking of demonetization and I was thinking of how in India, you know, the minute uh, it is announced that the prime minister will address the nation, there are these memes that go around with people's hair standing on end. and It's always, it's always like terrifying, you know, because it's in people's minds associated with some catastrophic event, you know, whatever, it's, whatever is going to come. So, um, 
you know, the idea of uh, uh, appearing on TV at eight o'clock at night and giving people until midnight, a nation of 1.38 billion people to lock down. And to me, that sentence connects to another sentence in this piece where I was talking with, you know, some of the, a small group of people as I walked with them. And he said, Ki shayad Modi ji ko bare mein pata nahi. You know, like the idea that here you have an administration, very cunning, very good at winning elections, with understanding of caste and religion and booth by booth data of how to win an election, but an ignorance of history, of economics, of how people work, where they work, where they come from, where they go. So, you know, to just ambush a nation of this complexity with that announcement is, what, uh, is why I said that. Yeah, because the, this entire thing, the way it took place, I mean, you, you mentioned in, in the next article about the 16 people run over by the train and so on. Um, this entire policy seems like a crime against humanity. You know, it doesn't just seem like a failed policy. I'm glad that you're the first person that said it because that's what I was thinking too. But you know, if you look at how the whole thing is being covered, I mean, um, I remember in 2011, uh, I wrote an introduction to a collection of essays in a book called Broken Republic. And I was talking about how people like Chidambaram, who was the finance minister and the home minister, you know, they had an overt policy of of changing the population patterns of India. Like they wanted people to move out from the villages into cities. And it was, a, it was something that they planned and did, which is why you had this massive displacement. Uh, of course, there's the fragmentation of land and the, uh, the kind of unsustainability of the Indian village that was being encouraged more or less. And you had this huge population moving into cities. In the cities, there was no place for them. So, so what I've been saying for so many years is that, in fact, in the imagination of the state, these people don't have a place. And if you notice, they don't have a place anymore in literature. They don't have a place in poetry. They don't have a place in cinema. You know, the cinema, even up to the 70s, there was a great dignified presence of the poor. There was the anger of the poor. But when cinemas became multiplexes, you know, Bollywood also pushed the poor away from it. So the only place where they'd figure perhaps are in NGO brochures to raise funds or something. And it is this erasure from the imagination that has created the situation today, you know, where you just, you just, pack them into the crevices of cities, you pretend they don't exist. And the situations in which they live, we know, right? I mean, the tenements, the, 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 the outlying farmlands turn into tenements where 10 people share a room, where the landlords force them to buy groceries and rations at rates much higher than the market. There's a kind of the breakup of the factory floor, the, the breakup of unions, the dismantling of labor laws. And now the disaster is upon us and the solution is the further disillusion, uh, the further dissolving of protection, labor laws and so on. It is really a failure of the imagination, a failure to understand that this is a very unique country in a unique time with a unique population. You cannot cut and paste what is done in Italy or in the US or in Spain onto India. And what was done was a cut and paste, and the, the result is a disaster. And as you said, uh, I would say, yes, it's a crime against humanity. I mean, what's really powerful about the most recent piece in the Financial Times, it's called After the Lockdown, We Need a Reckoning. Um, you know, most people after the lockdown ends are going to, you know, go to the park or visit people and so on. But Arundhati Roy is going to spend her time organizing the COVID trials, as you call them. You say at the end, we need COVID trials in an international court, at the very least. 
that's my post lockdown reverie um well, could you talk a little about the covid trials so actually the financial times really what they did was they asked me can you write 150 words for us about what you're most looking forward to doing when the lockdown ends like meeting your friend or going to a place in the city that you missed and so i said listen sorry i don't have these 150 happy words so just ask someone else and the editor said no come on just write whatever you want you know so i wrote this little piece and but i i mean i was talking about the fact that you know you have a situation where there were 545 covid positive cases with 10 deaths when they announced the sudden lockdown after delay darling for two months and then this punitive lockdown at the end of which even by the own fake fake uh, government figures now you have more than 125000 cases and it spread all over because of the exodus and so on so and then you have this stigmatization that took place you have the uh, you had the stigmatization of muslims as the spreaders of disease you've had killings so so and then now you have a situation where you created this exodus people jammed into into uh, sort of labor camps which were known as quarantine camps and people jammed in bus stops people jammed on highways no social distancing that horrible term that people use who don't understand caste but then you've created a situation where this labor force is now gone home in these traumatic conditions and is spreading the virus in the countryside meanwhile you have you know the elite uh, and we have tv shows about how planes are being sanitized and airports are being sanitized for them and i said so what what are we thinking now are we going to hermet in the age of covid doing this means you have plans to hermetically seal the flying classes off from the walking classes so so i said so so apart from caste apartheid you're going to have religious apartheid with your new citizenship law and the lynchings and the detention camps and and you're going to have a kind of class apartheid where one class their bodies are a biohazard to the other class you know so in this context i said that this kind of havoc that has been created we need an accounting and when i say covid trials obviously i would have liked to say revolution you know but the point is with, with when i say covid trials it comes from me as a person who has lived so many years in this country where you stop expecting any result from a trial but you know that the documentation that it creates is in itself an act a revolutionary act and we really need to know what the hell happened you know you had this media you had weird sort of virologists and epidemiologists just throwing out whatever theories they wanted everyone has been terrorized everyone is stigmatized nobody knows what to believe you you really led us into a horror show so somehow to unravel this you need some kind of systematic uh information at least that's that's what i meant you know i can't bloody well go and have a walk in the park uh, when when all of us are just it's been harrowing you know for those who are walking it's been harrowing for those who are thinking it's been harrowing uh for everybody um uh, i think this is a very good idea and i look forward to uh, the international tribunal it's like the Rus russell tribunal for covid trials and i think starting in india and brazil may be a good idea like the iraq war tribunal you know i was on the jury there and i i, I saw how much work happened because unless we can unpack this thing it will be done to us again and this moment of panic it's a panic demic it is being used to control us more and more all kinds of things are happening even now you know fake news fake videos scare videos fake phone calls you know it's 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 a it's a state that's preparing to to kind of steal our oxygen forever 
and we've got to break out. Uh, I, we're gonna, I just want to ask one little question. Uh, in the middle of all this, there was a poll release. I'm sure you saw it because the media made a lot of it, which showed the Prime Minister's popularity has risen. What are we to make of these kind of polls? This strike me as more propaganda than actual evidence of anything. And yet, here it is. It's a poll. Well, you know, first of all, I don't know, like, in this situation, who could they have polled, you know, those people who have phone numbers or on the internet or something. So this particular poll, I wouldn't pay much mind to. However, I think that we have to be prepared to understand. And I think quite often the left in its rationality doesn't understand. There's a massive game of psychology, of aspiration and imagination going on. Like one of the things that's going around is, you know, saying that Modi is Abhimanyu. He's alone. He's caught in the Chakravyu. People are gerawing him. So the Hindus, you must come to his rescue. So the man who effed up like a billion people is now the wicked victim of, uh, you know, everybody else, including those people. But then one cannot minimize the appeal of something like this, you know. So uh, I think uh, people are psychologically fragile, frightened. Um, so what I, I actually don't, I don't know what's going to come out of this. All I know for sure is that if there's a breakdown, you know, now you can see the seams coming apart at the edges. You can see rioting. You can see people fighting for food. It's not political. It's sporadic right now. But if there were some kind of massive unrest, it will be immediately sought to be managed with more Hindutva, more communalism, more trying to blame a particular community or a particular you know kind of politics or particular people you know so we can expect more of the same in a heightened situation of fear and control i mean as you know while everyone's locked down these people are moving their chessmen very fast people are being arrested muslim students young people being arrested under draconian under the uapa even today, two young uh, students of JNU were arrested. Uh, everything is being put into place in the hope that when things reopen, the old protests against CAA and all don't rise up again. So while we are locked up, they are doing everything to, to consolidate their positions. Including the arrests, including our friend, our news click friend, Gautam Navlakha, and uh, leftward author Anand Teltum, they picked up in the middle of this lockup. Um, yes. Arundhati Roy, thank you so much for joining us at NewsClick. You're welcome. It's my pleasure.